This episode is dedicated to our brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael. We are with you, body and soul. Let's all add in Teshuva, Tefillah, and Tzedakah, and Betachon Trust. And pray for Mashiach Mamash now. You're listening to the Gate of Trust podcast. Join hosts Matt Trash and Felix Friedberg's heart-to-heart conversations with artists, entrepreneurs, scholars, and laymen who by strengthening their trust in God despite all odds, experience outright miracles. Profound yet practical, inspiring and heart-wrenching, moving true stories of triumph against adversity. Trusting in God can literally save lives. And now, Gate of Trust podcast hosts, Matt and Felix. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Felix. And this is the Gate of Trust podcast. Hey, Felix, got a joke? Difficult at these times to be joking, but I, uh, I'm going to do my best to, uh, to lighten the mood today. So two men are waiting for a train. The younger man asks the older man for the time, but the older man ignores him. After a while, the younger man asks for the time, and again, the older man ignores him. The young man gets frustrated and says, listen, why won't you answer me when I ask you for the time? And the older man explains, look, I'm going to tell you the time. Then we're going to start talking. And then when the train comes, you're probably going to sit next to me. And then we're going to get to know each other. And eventually I'll invite you to my house for Shabbat dinner. And then you'll meet my daughter. And you'll probably get along. And then you might get engaged. And I have to ask you, why would I want a son-in-law who can't even afford a watch? (laughs) Pretty good. It speaks to the tradition of buying your your son-in-law a watch as a wedding gift. And this is probably why. Speaking of time, we have Amanda Sparrow on the Gate of Trust podcast today. We're very excited to speak with her. At 21 years of age, Amanda was diagnosed with cancer. As a cancer survivor, Amanda travels the world sharing her story, focusing on the power of positivity in the face of challenge. How did Amanda put her life on hold and come to grips with her frightening situation? How did Amanda's journey help her tap into the power of her Jewish neshama? And how did Amanda see the hand of God at work and revealed miracles in her life? All this and more as Amanda Spiro shares her inspiring story on the Gate of Trust podcast. Here's Amanda Spiro. Hello, everyone. <laughs> tell us, who are you? Where are you from? And tell us your whole story. Oh, Start wow. There. Yeah. How, how long do we have? Do we have hours? Shabbos we is have like coming soon. I have cooking this is to the do. Lo- this is a long form. It's a new style. This could be two hours. You never oh, know. wow. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Let's do it. My name is Amanda Spiro, and I am from Montreal, and I travel the world sharing my story of positivity, resilience, and hope. I went through cancer, and really my mission is to empower people and to give people strength and to allow people to really connect to their true selves, to help them through any challenge or any situation. I'm also a color teacher, so I teach brides all over the world with Zoom and in Montreal. And I'm a mother of three beautiful children, my three miracle children. And actually, just very recently, me and my husband started a shluchus in Trois-Rivières, which is about an hour and a half away from Montreal. We were sent from my rabbi, from the Montreal Torah Center, Rabbi New, who wanted us to really just go there, scope out the scene, you know, build a community. We really believed and felt that there were Jews hiding. So our job was really to go seek them. So that's what we've been busy with, you know, going as much as we possibly can. We've essentially been going every month. We try to go for every holiday. And slowly but surely, we're building up the community. So far, we've had a bar mitzvah for a boy who's 18 years old. He never had a bar mitzvah before. His mother passed away when he was really young. We're also organizing a bris for a child who's four years old and has many complications. And we're trying to facilitate that. And we have an Airbnb every time we go there. And it's really just an open place for people to come and to explore their Judaism and to really tap into their neshama. So... That's what I'm busy with. And on the side, I do work for my husband. We do tax consulting. So that also takes up a lot of my time. So I'm very busy. (laughs) So that's a little bit about me. (laughs) I remember hearing about your tax consulting. I thought it was very interesting. Tell us, you do something specific to help people with disabilities. Is that right? Yes, yes. So we help people with a program in Canada, the disability tax credit. So it's a very specific program. It's very difficult to get approved for it. So we specialize in this. My husband's an expert in this. And we really just try and help as many people as we can get back money retroactively. We're able to go back a maximum of 10 years and help people get back money for their medical condition. So 
this is what we do. So oh, I'm on the phone add. all day talking Incredible. all over Canada <laughs> and trying to help people. I'm going to ask a, a sticky question. I think it's a question my wife would like to ask. My wife has a so Jewish it. Money Matters podcast. So here's a question for you. You say that you work for your husband. Do you work uh-huh. for him or do you work with your husband? I work for him. You know why? Why? <laughs> because I always say, I don't want that stress of running my own company. So when I started working for him, I said, I never want to feel like we're in this together. Yes, we're in this together that I completely support him and I'm there whenever he needs me, but I'm doing so many different things. I just want to show up. I just want this to be a job. I don't want that extra stress. So I feel like I treated very seriously, especially because I'm not running the show. He is. So I show up, I do what I got to do. I leave and there's no pressure, no stress because really being a Jewish mother, there's enough pressure in my home with my children. That's really my main job. And that's what I need to be zoomed in and focused. So yes, I work for my husband. <laughs> well, amazing. It actually goes along with the, the concept of Bitakon that when we work, of Hasidus, when we work, we work with our hands, not with our head and our hearts. And of course, the difference between somebody who's the owner of the company versus a worker at the company is that the owner goes home at night and he can't sleep nights and the worker goes home. He has his nine to five or her nine to five and exactly and he's able to live a peaceful life. So I think you're definitely on the right path as as Bitachon goes. You have a very interesting story and you're really inspiring the world with that story. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that happened and how did you get through that difficult time of your life? Okay. So my story is is that I was a girl that was raised in Montreal with everything I could possibly need and want. I grew up in a very loving family. I had it all, lots of friends, I traveled the world went to great camps, vacations. I always felt like something was missing in my life. That's really what it came down to. And only later on, I discovered that that missing something was a relationship with God. And how did I discover that? Is I was forced to learn that when I went through something very tragic. I actually lost my best friend when I was 17 years old. She passed away in a car accident suddenly. She was a celebrity. She was on the front page of the People magazine. Her name was Jacqueline Michelle Linetsky. She was the voice of Caillou, the TV cartoon character. And that was very, very difficult for me. And that really forced me to look inwards. I asked a lot of questions. I got zero answers. I would go to everyone, specialists, psychologists, social workers, guidance counselors, and I had zero comfort. No one said anything that resonated with me. And I would always just leave every appointment disappointed and frustrated. And then fast forward a couple of years later, I decided to go on the March of Living, where you go to Poland for a week and you go to Israel. And on this trip, I met Penny Ganevish, who I think is another celebrity. <laughs> I really just opened up to him about everything that I was going through. I was still in a lot of pain. It was a couple years later and I still just never came back to myself. I even forced myself to go on this trip. Like I felt like I just needed to get away and put myself in a completely different environment. And when I spoke to Penny, it was actually the first time I ever spoke with a rabbi. I think it's Rabbi Ganevish who actually introduced us. Oh, right. That's true. Right. Thank you, Rabbi (laughs) Ganevish. Yes. Special shout out. So I always say I'm totally indebted to him. He completely changed my life and I'm so grateful and so, so appreciative. So thank you so much. So I met him on that trip and I opened up to him about everything that I was going through in the past couple of years, just a lot of grief, a lot of sadness, just feeling lost. He shared with me a loss that he had experienced. Simultaneously, while he was sharing this loss, he shared with me how he dealt with it. And he basically introduced me to Hasidus, which was so foreign to me. I just remember right then and there thinking, wow, wow. <laughs> It like went over my head, but it was pretty powerful. And I was like, if I thought of life like this, life would be that much easier. To really, really trust that God is orchestrating it all and that he's in charge and we have very little control, right? And that everything's for the good and everything's meant to be. I was like, whoa, wow. And he really was the happiest person I've ever met in my life. He was like so giddy all the time and he was always in such good spirits. He had a really good energy and a good vibe. I really connected to everything he said and I felt connected to him and I really wanted to just share so much more with him knowing like, wow, I feel like this rabbi has the answers and he's free. He's on this trip. I don't need to pay him. Every other session was an arm and a leg and I got nothing out of it. (laughs) Fast forward, I came home from the trip. He invited me to his home for Shabbos. I met his entire family, his beautiful family, and I basically became family right away. It was instant. I spent many, many Shabbases there and I asked many, many questions. And every time I left there, I was just so inspired, 
so inspired by his family, by his children, the way they were raised. It was always a really good feeling. I was very naive. I never even knew that someone could become religious. And I'm grateful for that, actually, because I never had that Jewish guilt. I never felt like, am I wearing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? So I was so comfortable. I look back now and I'm a little bit uncomfortable, like, uh oh, what did I say back then? Was it appropriate? You know, but because of that, because I let my guard down, I was completely vulnerable. I got so many answers. It was really such a big part of my healing. Fast forward, I was diagnosed with cancer. That was the moment. When I was diagnosed, I was sick for a really long time. I would say like about a year, not knowing what was wrong with me, different symptoms, back and forth to different doctors and specialists, and no one had answers for me. And I was almost made to feel like I was a hypochondriac. And then finally, I went to the hospital thinking I was having a heart attack. And this time they did find something. They told me, obviously, that it was not a heart attack, but there was an enzyme that was released in my heart at a very abnormally high level. So they needed to dilute it. I needed to be on IV. And I need to just get it out of my system. So I was at the hospital for 10 days. And even after that, they didn't really have any answers for me. I did discover then that I had a muscular condition, a neuromuscular condition, which I can't even pronounce. It's called carotene palmitol transference 2 deficiency. It's a very, very rare condition. And it really only came out because my body was so weak and my immune system was so low. And after that period of time, I left the hospital and I was searching and I was looking to do further testing outside of Montreal. This went on for a while. This was very difficult period in my life, just not knowing what was going on and knowing deep down that something was wrong. I really felt it till I woke up one day feeling very similar to how I felt months earlier. And I rushed myself to the hospital and I went to go see a family friend who is a doctor and they did all these different types of tests. And then... I was told that I had a cancerous tumor in my chest and it was 11.4 centimeters. It was extremely large. I had to jump into all the treatments, didn't have a second to think or to process or to internalize. Of course, I was misdiagnosed, of course. And the hospital called the doctor, the original hospital where I was treated. They read the report and the report said high prominence in chest highly recommendation to do CT scan with infusion immediately. And it was never done back then. And so really, I would say maybe a couple days later that week, I had to do a biopsy. I had to recover from the biopsy. And then I jumped into very heavy chemotherapy. Um, I did it every second week. In addition to that, I had radiation once the treatments was done every single day for two months. I did steroid therapy. I did white blood cell shots just to keep my immune system high as much as possible. So it was a lot of treatment. This was over a year period. This was very difficult. However, when I found out I had cancer because I was misdiagnosed and because I felt so unwell for so long, in a weird way, I was relieved. I really felt like I knew it, like something's wrong. And thank God I was told that I was going to be fine from the get-go. So I never had that fear, God forbid, that this was it. I really had so much hope and so much faith and trust that I was going to get through this. And I had an amazing support team. And Penny, of course, was the leader of it all. He, Him and his beautiful wife, I called them right away. They were the first people I told. I just knew that they would know what to say. When I told people about Jackie, my friend dying, no one really had anything to say. You know, the answers I would often get was like, it's so tragic. It's so unfair. It doesn't make sense. And that just never felt good for me. That brought zero comfort. So, you know, I reached out to Penny. I, he was actually on his way to Israel and he promised me he was going to pray for me. He asked me for my Hebrew name. It was the first time I knew what my Hebrew name was. And my Hebrew name is Sarah Riva Bastina Malka. And after that, you know, he came back from Israel and I would just go there for Shabbos all the time, regularly. I would often sleep there. I just basically started keeping Shabbos to whatever I knew. I remember the first Shabbos that I experienced was when he came home from Israel and it was in the summertime and he has a cottage and I went there for the weekend with his extended family. There was tons and tons of people there. It was a big party. That Shabbos was like a true island in time. I remember just feeling like I just let go of everything. I was so welcomed and I enjoyed it so much. And I learned so much again. 
And I just fell in love with Shabbos, you know, totally unplugged and really connected. You know, I always say like, how can you not like Shabbos? It is so relaxing, delicious food, good energy. Till this day, it's something I look forward to every single week. It's such a big part of my healing. And then basically, you know, my story evolves that just, it was divine providence. Like everything just happened on its own organically, one thing to the next. God led me along a journey from one mitzvah to the next mitzvah. And I always say like, I wasn't searching for them. They just came to me, you know? And every time I learned something, I was just so fascinated by it all. And I I just wanted to connect with it. I wanted to learn more and explore more and do more. That's really my journey, you know, from every part, from wearing a wig, you know, I had no hair at the time. I was completely bald. So I was forced to wear a wig and I was forced to learn about the power of hair and the reason why Jewish women cover it, right? Leaving it for nobody else but their husband. I just learned about everything. Shomer Nagia, for example, was another thing. I wasn't allowed to touch anyone while I was undergoing treatment. My immune system was so, so low. And so by default, I became Shomer Nagia. You know, I met my husband actually at this time. And we really just connected on a soul level. It wasn't about anything physical. And I really saw such a difference in that. It was such a special bond and connection that we shared because we were forced to really connect and to talk and to share and to open up to one another. I became Shomer Nagia. What else could I tell you? (laughs) Amanda, you were talking about the whirlwind of misdiagnosis. What was going through your mind? The time from the first hospitalization to the next hospitalization, you had to be thinking some worrisome thoughts. What what was your frame of mind at, at that time? So like I mentioned, everything happened really quickly. I actually didn't have so much time to think. But again, I remember just calling Penny and him just like filling me with so much hope, telling me that he was there for me and his family was there for me and the community was there for me. And I just felt this sense of support I remember just knowing that I was going to be okay. And I kept telling myself I was going to be okay. I didn't know how I was going to be emotionally, but I knew physically that I was going to get through it. And I knew that it was not going to be easy. And the doctor told me that from the get-go. Right away, he told me I had to stop school, that my immune system was going to be low. I couldn't be in such a public place. I'd be extremely tired. I would have to let go of, you know, many social things. I think in a way that was the hardest part, you know, just dealing with people, having to tell people about my diagnosis, I was very worried. I really didn't want the negativity. I knew that everyone's answer would be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. That's so unfair. Why is this happening to you? You already just went through so much and I really didn't want to hear it. So I was kind of like avoiding people in a way. But I remember what really, really helped me was my brother, my older brother, who is extremely wise. He is not observant, but he's a very spiritual, good soul, good neshama. He's a mensch. He's really a great guy. He was about to start law school and he planned this whole trip to Europe. And I remember thinking he cannot find out about my diagnosis because if he finds out, he's going to come home. And he planned this trip and he was so much looking forward to it. But of course he came home, which was of course very emotional. I remember coming home from an appointment at the hospital and seeing my brother and just like the tears just did not stop coming down. And my brother took me out and he gave me like a pep talk, an older brother. He's always all kind of been like an older figure, like a fatherly figure to me. And he said to me, Amanda, you have two options right now. You could either be bitter or you could be better. And I realized right then and there that no matter what we're going through in our life, whatever challenges and setbacks that we always have those two options to be positive or to be negative. And I chose to be positive and I needed a lot of support to be positive. But what really kept me going was I really was just thinking about the end. It was like a countdown for me. I knew how many treatments I had. I was very focused. My doctor told me, you know, if I wasn't taking care of myself, if I wasn't listening, I might have to do more treatments because my immune system was so low that if I caught anything, it would postpone the treatment. So it was almost like COVID. I was very careful. I often wore a mask. I often stayed home. I was very focused on just like finishing these treatments and then getting better. And because of everything I learned with the Ganevish family and the community, I was almost so excited to get better and to start living my life according to what I learned during that long and difficult journey. And that really kept me going. 
I was very excited. I really, you know, was manifesting what my life would look like. I realized what was important, what wasn't important. Like, I feel like all of a sudden I got so many answers. And it was like almost this feeling of being very calm, almost like I figured it out and I'm 21 years old. I was planning to go to Israel and that was something that really kept me going, something to look forward to, something to keep me busy with. There was a lot of paperwork to do and a lot of things to coordinate and organize where am I living, what program am I doing? So that was a big part of my journey also of just keeping busy. And that's always what I always tell people to do whenever they're going through something, just keep busy, stay focused You know, another thing was I started a charity. The charity, I called it Amanda's Live, Laugh, and Learn Fun. So live like each day is your last. Laugh with all your heart and soul, even in times of adversity, and learn from everything and everyone around you so our children and their children will live in a healthier world. And we raised over $150,000. And all that money went towards enhancing the chemotherapy rooms at the hospital where I was treated just to make it a little bit easier for my fellow patients. So I feel like putting myself in an environment of growth, connecting to God, keeping busy doing what we're meant to do, which is connecting to our source, to mitzvahs, right? Mitzvah means connection. Every time we do a mitzvah, we connect. So I was just trying to connect and to stay focused to just not lose track of what I'm meant to be doing now. I felt like that was my purpose. You know, I always, as a young girl, like I said, I I struggled a lot with anxiety, never knew what was missing, just never felt so easy. All of a sudden, I felt like God revealed himself to me. And I knew what I was meant to do. I knew what my purpose was, what my mission was. And I was very busy with that. And just learning and exploring and connecting, I think that gave me a lot of faith during that time. And just the trust, just trusting that I was going to be okay and not allowing myself to go anywhere else. And often people would say to me, like, do you ever think about this? And what happens if this happens? Are you scared? And I always just redirected my thoughts. Like those thoughts, of course, would come up here and there. You know, there are complications. And actually a very close friend of mine, her name was also Jackie. She had cancer when I had cancer. Actually, when I was diagnosed, she was just overcoming her cancer and she was a big source of inspiration for me. And she gave me a lot of strength and a lot of hope. And we became very, very close. And then I got well, I went into remission. And then a couple years later, she was re-diagnosed and she relapsed and she actually didn't make it. She passed away. I remember thinking, wow, I could relapse like that could happen. And it's always a thought in my mind. But I really always just try and remain as positive as possible and try to redirect those thoughts. And I always say, like, what are those thoughts going to do? They're not going to serve me. They're just going to bring me down, make me feel really bad. I always say that, you know, if God forbid anything would to ever happen, I'll deal with it then. And I really just trust that God gives us all the tools we need in order to deal with anything we're going through in life. So in this moment, I'm healthy and I want to feel healthy and I don't want to bring any of that energy into my space. So I really try not to go there. So I'm very focused with my thoughts, even till this day to just like, to stay focused, to not let my thoughts take me down. So Amanda, it really sounds like the cancer was like rocket fuel for transforming your life to Hasidus, to Bitachon, to all of these things. Mm -hmm. It was a gift. It was a gift. The way, the way that you approached it, I'm sure you thought what, what would have happened had you not had cancer? Absolutely. I think about that all the time. I think about who I would have married, what my life would have looked like, where I would have been. And every day I wake up and the first thing I do is say Modani. And not only do I say that prayer, but I think about it. Like, what am I grateful for? I'm very into journaling. I do the five minute journal, which I encourage everyone to get. You know, it's so much in alignment with Torah of just waking up and thinking about all the wonderful things in our life. I think about that, that I'm so grateful for what I have in my life who I surround myself with in my community, my relationship with God and my relationship to the Rebbe. And it keeps me strong on a daily basis. It really does. Even now, you know, we're going through a war. It is so hard and we're all so broken. But we know that there's a commandment in the Torah to be besimcha. And we know that there's a commandment in the Torah not to be angry. And I just feel like God gives us everything we need in every situation we're in. And it's not always easy, but I believe that we have all the support and we have all the tools and we just need to tap in. So personally, my advice always is whenever I'm in a difficult situation, I just tap in more. 
I just go deeper in. I want to connect even more. I want to be in more of alignment with God. And I just try to say that even in this war, we all have our own purpose, what we could do. And essentially, we know what the Rebbe's thoughts are on all this. We just have to bring more light into the world. So now I'm like laser focused on just what could I do? I wake up every day and I say to myself, what could I do today to bring more light, to bring more positivity in this world? You know, I try not to allow those negative thoughts to enter my mind, the anxiety, the fear, because it's there. It exists, right? The Yitzhahara creeps in on us on a daily basis. But I try again to just like push those thoughts away and to just be present in every moment and be grateful and to be focused of what we need to do. Amazing. 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 Your approach is amazing. And it really shows the the way we should also approach to transform our present situation. It's always timely. Torah is always right. timely. The Rebbe Absolutely. tells us we, li- we live with the Torah in our times. And so mm-hmm. you really bring it, you really bring it down. I'm usually the one who talks too much. Today's uh, <laughs> podcast, I'm speechless. I really am so impressed by your story, and not only that you had such a challenge and got through it with positivity, but that really you've transformed your life. You've been able to learn from what happened and communicate it to others and inspire them to use these tools of faith and betachon, trust, to really transform your life. You recognize that on a daily basis, we always have these thoughts, but the practice of betachon, the practice of bringing trust back is saying, I know that God is there. I know everything that's happening is for the good. What can I do to make the world even brighter? It's really incredible and inspiring to us and I'm sure to everyone who's listening here how you're able to do that and how you've turned this into a whole life mission that you're going out Mm -hmm. on speaking tours to share your light with the world. So I really want to applaud you for what you're doing and how you're doing it. And I don't think we could even communicate these concepts as beautifully as you have today. Thank you. So my question is this, looking backwards, Wow, a coincidence. You went on a trip, and on that trip, you met this rabbi. Wow, There's no such thing as coincidences, right? Felix. What a coincidence. And then, <laughs> and then you have this wonderful brother, and this wonderful brother takes a pause and comes, and the idea, the bitter or better, like, I'm, I'm not stealing that. I'm like, I'm keeping that. That's, that's so good. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, I think we could sell bracelets, like mm-hmm. a million of Let's them. Let's do today, it. Let's do today. it. Like, we could have bracelets. So, Somebody listening would say, gosh, yeah, yeah, like, you know, of course, you know, she met this, this rabbi and then, oh, and then she, and then she meets their husband, of course, you know, it's great. But what about me? What about me? I, um, you know, there's a lot of us that don't feel like we're connected and we don't feel like, you know, the, the common Jewish, I don't belong here. I don't belong there. Like, you know, woe is me. So what would your words be for someone like that, that they, we feel like they're stuck. They're not. They're having physical, emotional problems. They're doom scrolling all day. It could be any day. It doesn't, there's a war, but there's any given day. There's right. all kinds of things going on that you could feel bad. Mm-hmm. So what would your advice be to someone that is stuck? Mm-hmm. You, you became unstuck. Mm-hmm. You unstuck mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah. And which, which we all have to do. Everyone really has to do it themselves. But what is your, someone that's listening and people mm-hmm. listen and, and I know that we're going to get very wonderful feedback. So for those that are listening that are stuck, what are two or three things you suggest to be okay. stuck? So I just want to put a disclaimer first, right? Cause I feel like often I share and I sound so positive and I make it sound so easy, but no, I put a lot of work. It's an investment. And that's my advice is that the more you put in, the more you'll get out of it, right? So I really try to engage in a relationship with God on a daily basis to enrich that relationship and to strengthen that relationship so that I could feel connected. It doesn't just happen, right? It's the same idea of going to a gym. You don't just like build muscles and start looking good and start feeling healthy. You got to eat well. You got to show up at the gym. It's a lot of work, right? Anyone that looks really good, they don't just look good. They put a lot of work into that. Like us. And it's this, right? No kidding. No kidding. (laughs) It's hard to be this handsome. Is there any filters on this or no? That's what you guys actually look like. (laughs) So. You know, we need to build our spiritual muscles. That's really my advice on a daily basis. We really have to show up every day. If we want to feel the reward and the connection and the positivity, we need to show up and we need to engage in a relationship with God. I think that's really what it comes down to. 
I think also like just, you know, discussing the war because it's hard not to because it's what we're dealing with right now. You know, thank God. It's a question that often people ask. So I'll just answer it is that I'm still friends with all my friends from before. So a lot of my platform on social media is not religious. A lot of my friends are not religious. More than ever, I see people that are just searching right now and are yearning and want to connect. And that's the idea. And I'm so grateful that I connected and I'm so grateful that I'm still connecting and that I'm grateful for what I have because I see that without Hasidus, without trust and faith in God, life is very hard. It's almost impossible. I really believe that. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how beautiful you are, how many vacations you have planned, jewelry, clothing, whatever that is. If you don't have a relationship with God, you're always going to feel lost. You're always going to feel stuck. And I actually think it's so beautiful. I hate that it has to come from a war, but I see that everyone's neshama is just waking up right now because that's it. When we're so broken, we need something to help us get through it. We need light. And I'm seeing so many people that I'm shocked by that are lighting Shabbos candles, that are reaching out to me, that they want to learn about the mikvah, that they want to, you know, bake challah. There is so much good going on in this world. I think it's pretty impressive, but I really believe that it shouldn't take this for us to connect and tap in. We almost need to feel this sense of urgency on a daily basis. And also, like you were mentioning, you know, that things in a sense did happen very organically for me. And, you know, I always say like God gave everything to me on a silver platter, but the truth of the matter is I actually don't think I'm unique. I think that God does that to each and every one of us, every single Jew, but not everyone's open to it and not everyone's eyes are able to see that. So I think that God sends us miracles on a daily basis and he reveals himself to us on a daily basis. We just have to be aware of it. And I think in order to do that, my next advice, tip number two or three, I can't keep track, is we need to quiet down. We need to have more moments of silence to connect. If we're constantly going and running and hustle bustle and one job to the next and we can't catch our breath, when do we take that precious moment to reflect? How are we even able to have time to connect with God. I have friends that don't even have time to eat or don't have time to exercise. Like, I don't have time. I'm so busy. If you're not making time for that, you have to make time for God. You have to engage. If you have to wake up a little bit earlier and do some meditation and have some quiet time before your kids wake up, you got to do what you got to do. That's the first thing you got to do when you start your day. You have to be very intentional about it. You got to make the time for it and have that relationship. And I think once you do that, you'll have more self-awareness you'll be able to see the world very differently with different eyes. And you'll see that God's there and he loves us and he's there with us on this journey. And we need to trust him along the way, even when things don't make sense to us, like what we're going through now. We can't even try to understand. There are no answers. God's infinite and we're finite. But I always say, like, what's the alternative to not trust in God? Wow. What would life look like then? Life would really be ugly and messy. But if we really trust that there's another element. There's another layer. There's something deeper going on in the world that we're not able to see. One day when Mashiach comes, we'll see it. So if we want to see it, we got to bring Mashiach. So how do we bring Mashiach? By doing mitzvahs, by elevating this world and bringing heaven down to earth and by connecting on a daily basis and just doing whatever we could possibly do and just stay focused. I remember also, you know, this is a big part of my life, so I'll share it. I have a father who's really not well. I have a father who was diagnosed with a rare form of Alzheimer's at the young age of 62 years old. He is now 67. I remember that was very difficult. That was a very challenging time. I remember thinking like after I got cancer, like there's no way that God's going to challenge me with anything else. That was a lot. Like I'm done, you know, everything's going to be good from this point on. And then that happened. I'm like, no, I, I, I can't. Like, I don't even know if I have enough spiritual muscles to deal with this. It was hard and I wasn't able to practice what I preach. And I really, again, like I said, I knew that there was, no other answer but to dig deeper and to strengthen. And maybe I wasn't as connected as I thought I was. And I remember speaking to my mashpia, my mentor at the time, and her advice to me, and it's my advice to everyone, I just keep doing it and saying it, is to just keep going, is to just keep going, doing what we're meant to do. We have a purpose. We have a mission. We have direction. We have a GPS that guides us to where we need to get to. And we just have to keep going. As hard as it is, we just need to show up and we need to go and we need to trust that we're resilient and we have everything within us to deal with it all. We have that superpower, especially as a Jewish woman. Jewish women are very powerful. This is what I teach on a daily basis. We are very powerful. We have that inner strength we don't even know we have until we're forced to tap in. 
So we just need to tap in. We need more quieter moments. We need to connect and we need support at times as well. It's okay to get support. It's okay not to be okay. And that's what a mashpia is for. The Rebbe was very much about having a mashpia and being part of a community, setting yourself up for success and learning and growing. And everything's there. Like you said, everything is there for us. And life is also not always meant to be so easy, right? It's like expectations are limiting. People expect things to be so perfect and great. So when things don't work out the way we want, we're like miserable. Like, what do you mean? This is, this isn't great. This isn't working out. But if we almost expect and know and have the awareness that we are in Gullis, we're in Gullis. Life is meant to be hard. And thank God, even in the hard world that we're living in, in the dark moments, there's still so much good. But life is actually meant to be harder than easier in a sense, right? Right. So. We just have to, we have to keep going. One of the things you talked about was uh, was waking up and saying Madani and just encapsulating what you're talking about is taking a moment. If we encourage people to take a moment and to have gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if we, if people slowed down and took that time and slowed down and maybe, you know, there's something in, in the secular world now about technology Shabbat, like where you, Mm -hmm. you're not on your phone and you're not on TV. And for those that are listening that aren't Shabbos observant, there is a concept of not shopping and not being on the phone and internet and unplugging, maybe unplugging and taking time to maybe read a, a Jewish book or have a thought, light a candle, mm-hmm. have a Shabbos meal. And, Absolutely. Um, I Absolutely. know in our community and probably your community, everyone's inviting people over for Shabbat meals. And so just uh, encouraging calmness and, and slow down and have gratitude and realize right. what, what we do have. Right. These are wonderful thoughts that you're sharing. Right. I actually just spoke in Missouri for the Rubenfelds, Shluchim there, unbelievable people. And they had an event last week on self-care. It was a spa for the soul event, which was all connected to self-care. We have to nurture ourselves. We need to fill our cups up and we need to take care of ourselves through self-care, but not just, you know, the manicure, the pedicure, the massage, really investing in our soul and that connection. It's such a buzzword now, self-care, right? Especially during COVID. That's all people were doing with self-care. But really, God really encouraged the Jewish people from before creation to self-care and to take care of ourselves. And our mitzvahs are really a way to do that, especially the mitzvahs that were entrusted to the Jewish women right? Lighting Shabbos candles, like you mentioned, baking challah, mikvah, family purity. They're all a way for us to have those quiet moments. Rosh Chodesh, it's also a Jewish woman's holiday to, we were meant to do nothing. (laughs) The men should take care of us. No, exactly. Half hour, we just sit with those lights and connect to those lights. But exactly, like Shabbos is around the corner and it's really just a time for us to be present, to be still, to light those Shabbos candles, to usher in Shabbos, to think about our week, reflect on our week. How could our week be better? That's our moment. Baking challah, also a very quiet moment. We say the blessing. We pray for everyone, pray for ourselves. And there's so much of that in Judaism. I really believe we have it all. God gives us these gifts on a daily basis, and we have to focus on the gifts. We can't always ask why, because we're not always going to get answers, and that's going to be very frustrating but we always need to say what, like we can't feel like the victim, right? We have to feel like, what could I do? Felix, what I hear is you asked her, how do you get unstuck or how did you get unstuck? But what I hear Amanda saying is that she gets unstuck every single day. She mm-hmm, tries to mm-hmm. find moments of opportunities to get unstuck. You've told Absolutely. us a little bit about from Modeani to your five minute journaling. What mm-hmm. other things do you do throughout the day? Tell us personally, Amanda Spira, what do you do to get unstuck along your day to connect and reconnect? So I wake up very early so that I have that precious time because I have three children and can get very busy. And I do my prayers and I do my meditation and I do my journaling and I make myself a nice cup of coffee and I actually sit with it and I drink it. Then I also swim every single morning. So that's my exercise. That's my movement, which I really believe is so important. I try and get fresh air as much as I possibly can. I really just try to set my day up that I wake up in the morning and then I'm excited to live my life. And I really am mindful of what I need, what's good for me, who I want to surround myself with, trying to be around people that are like-minded, that I will connect with, that I will grow from good energy. I try to go to sleep early as much as I possibly can. I try to invest in all my relationships that are really important to me. I try to get involved. 
as much as I can. But again, I know how to say no, which I really believe is self-care, you know, especially now, for example, there are so many initiatives and I encourage them and they're beautiful. But if I were to say yes to all of them, I would not be taking care of myself. So I really know how to say no. I try to have healthy boundaries on myself so that I could show up for my family and be my best self. So I really try to take care of myself in any which way I can. Also, you know, going through what I went through, to be honest, there's always a little bit of trauma, like post-traumatic stress disorder, that a lot of stress, anxiety could create illness. And so I'm always trying to be mindful of like, slow down, Amanda, like you can't do it all. You can't stay up really late planning this and planning that. Like you need to sleep. You need to sleep is restorative, right? Shabbos, that's why we need Shabbos. But I believe we need a little bit of Shabbos throughout the week. We can't just wait to Shabbos to start breathing and to start connecting and to start resting. We need to do that on a daily basis. We can't overwhelm our schedules. It's too much. I think people are pulled in too many different directions and sometimes you're not successful that way. There's like multitasking is like, oh my God, she's a multitasker. But actually I think multitasking sometimes isn't so good. Like sometimes it's just too much and it's too overwhelming. We get burnt out very easily. So I'm very careful to eat well, sleep well, exercise, get movement, make time for God and that relationship. And of course, my family is my number one priority, you know, making sure that there's peace in the home and there's the right energy in the home. And in order to do that, I need to take care of myself. So that's really what I do. I try to do what I love to do, which is connecting with people, sharing my message, traveling the world, teaching brides is my most favorite thing in the world. And especially now with everything going on, that's been also a big healing for me. You know, at first I was like, how am I going to teach these girls? How am I going to give them inspiration? They need it so much right now. They're getting married. They're not rescheduling their weddings. How am I going to show up? And I realized if God put me in this position, it means that I'm capable. And so I really trusted that I have what it takes. And I've just been teaching a lot. And that's really been keeping me going, keeping me busy, keeping me out of trouble during this time. Because like you said, we get blocked every day. There's a lot of trouble in our mind. The only way to overcome that is to just connect, is to just connect. I'm just inspired. I've got to blown away. I've got to, I've got to do a little more. I I feel (laughs) not to put pressure. Pressure takes away pleasure. He looks like a swimmer, though. He's he's on the right track. He says, "I do swimming." I, I did. I he, did. He's not today. journaling. I don't think every five minutes, but he's you know uh, he's going no. swimming. <laughs> I do journal. I do journal. Oh, yeah. journal's oh, good. Yeah. It takes it takes less than five minutes. It's like three things you're grateful for, three intentions for the day, and an affirmation. See, you see, right? but me, I, if it says it's a five minute journal. I would do six minutes. You know, I have to overachieve. You're, you go above and beyond. Real men. I want to real men. Real men journal. Real men journal. Wow, you're so good. I feel like. Amanda wow. Spiro, thank you so much. This has been thank an incredible you. podcast interview with you. I also want to give you a blessing that you should have continued success. Is there anything you want to leave our listeners with how you can find that peace and worry-free life by connecting to Hashem with Batak? I think just never settling in life. We're meant to be happy. Our lives are meant to be enriched and enhanced. And so do everything in your power to find that light. Soul search on a daily basis. Engage in a relationship with God. Show up. Let go a bit of that control. Trust in God and do what God guides us to do and commands us to do. Put yourself in the right environment with the right people. Find that mentor. Find that rabbi, that rebbitzin that inspires you, that speaks to you, that understands you and meets you where you're at. And try and grow. Work on that relationship. And just always be in a place of growing and connecting even more. Man, Espiro, thank you so much for joining the Gate of Trust podcast. Thank you. I was about to ask you, Felix, what time is it? How long till the train? Well, I'm not wearing a watch, so I can't really tell you. Why would I want to do a podcast? The guy doesn't want to watch. (laughs) Felix, that was pretty awesome. Amazing. I think this is the easiest podcast interview because we didn't really have to even ask very much. She was just on fire saying all the right things about Betachon and her life and how she stays positive. She's a master. She's a Betachon master. She is. And I think it's just a good reminder for all of us that we have the, we have the power to do that. And bitter, bitter, better, better, right? Just a few weeks ago, I was at a Shabbos table. We were talking about the Tanya of the week, which was about Gamzul Tova. Yeah. Before October 7th, that was already a difficult concept, but now we could, we could find ourselves challenged and really 
we have to even in the darkest times really understand that Gamzu Latova as well and really seek out through deepening our learning and, and adding to our mitzvahs and adding to the light, as she pointed out, will help us get better day by day. We know and we trust Hashem that everything He's doing is for our good and it's bringing us closer to the days of Mashiach. And may we speedily see it today for good and may we have peace in the world finally with Mashiach. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Gate of Trust podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, leave a rating, and share the podcast with the people you love. To access today's show notes, ask Matt and Felix a question, or suggest the Gate of Trust story to be featured on the show, visit gateoftrust.org forward slash podcast.